Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jameson Dempsey. I'm an associate at Kelly Dry and Warren. It's a law firm in Washington, D.C. that focuses on, among other things, communications issues. I'm also the co-founder of a group called D.C. Legal Hackers that builds creative technological solutions to challenging issues at the intersection of law and technology. Uh, with me here today is John Heitman. John is the chair of Kelly Dry and Warren's communications group. He has more than 20 years experience representing uh, all sorts of companies in both the telecommunications and the technology space on issues including privacy, data security, and as relevant to this discussion, net neutrality. So uh, we're here today to talk about net neutrality, and many of you have probably been following uh, the debate in the U.S. Um, just last week on Thursday, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, which is the U.S. telecoms regulator, uh, issued a new set of rules that would impose strong net neutrality protections. Now, this has uh, impacts not only for the broadband providers who would be directly regulated, but also for the entire internet ecosystem. So today, we'll talk about what the rules said, how we got to now, and what the new rules mean for, uh, for technology companies, and in particular, the IoT. And uh, we'll wrap up by discussing how what just happened in the U.S. Might affect, uh, might affect the global debates about net neutrality. So uh, to begin the discussion, John, uh, let's start with a few basics. In a few words, what is net neutrality? Net neutrality is uh, the concept that the network should be neutral to things that people want to get to on the network. Uh, use on the network and attach to the network. So it comes in this form. It says uh, the concept is that consumers should be able to uh, connect to the network any devices they want. They should be able to get to the internet uh, websites they want to get to, unrestricted, as long as they're legal. And they should be able to use the applications they want on the network, including voice provided by some other provider other than your broadband provider. And so I think uh, that's the concept and that they should do it uh, in this, uh, you know, framed up, I think, in three ways. No blocking, no throttling, and uh, importantly, and this is uh, going to come into play, we'll discuss it a bit later, no paid prioritization. So those, that's the framework that the FCC adopted. Hmm. So, John, when the FCC adopted this new rule, it wasn't the first time that it tried, and actually these rules are after years of regulatory wrangling and litigation in the courts uh, over previous attempts from the sure. FCC to, uh, to impose net neutrality rules. So what's different about what the FCC did this time around? Well, you're right, Jameson. The FCC has been at this, looking at this issue for over a decade now. And the way they went about it originally was by classifying broadband internet access as an information service. That's a regulatory classification in the United States that gets a light regulatory touch, as opposed to a telecommunication service, which is a common carrier service that draws uh, utility regulation, old-style utility regulation. And uh, they went at it, and uh, they've uh, classified wireline and wireless broadband internet access as an information service. And then twice before, they went to try and put some rules, like the ones I just spoke about, no throttling, no blocking, no prioritization in place. And twice before, their decisions went to the courts and got overturned. And so the courts said, FCC, you can regulate here, but if you, you can't put this kind of regulation on providers who are information service providers. And so what they did was they reclassified the service as a telecommunication service, or a, as we call it, a common carrier service, and that would draw the framework of utility regulation in the United States. Gotcha. Um, so what exactly do these new net neutrality rules say? 
They say uh, three things to start. They say no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. And then they add a couple things onto the mix. They say there's a, a standard for future conduct. And I think this is uh, something that uh, folks in this room should uh, probably feel pretty good about. It says that the, uh, the providers cannot do things that would unduly discourage or disadvantage uh, others. So uh, it's a big provider, a big internet service provider, say AT&T. It can't design its service or its product in a way that makes others who want to offer, say, connected home devices mm -hmm. uh, on the outside. It's got to allow uh, for those things to be connected to those things to work with its network. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so one thing that uh, many commentators have pointed out is that in enacting these new rules, the FCC didn't limit itself solely to the specific net neutrality provisions, to no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, uh, and that by reclassifying broadband as a common carrier, it wrapped in a bunch of other provisions. So what are those other provisions that are most important for, for this audience to know about? Yeah, a, a couple more things that are important to know about. The, the FCC also did something different this time around that it hadn't done the two times before, and that it included mobile uh, broadband in the framework. It had previously accepted the idea that mobile broadband was different and should be treated differently. Uh, it, uh, it no longer accepts that idea. It says mobile broadband should be treated the same as wireline broadband. So the same framework of rules apply. So they, they did do that. They added the mobile broadband into it. And there are some other concepts as well. There's a concept about um, reasonable network management. Providers are allowed to engage in reasonable network management. What that actually entails remains to be seen. But um, that's a, a framework out there as well. Mm -hmm. um, there is a concept called specialized services as well. And this um, idea of specialized services, if you think about it at the outset, it could be something that could swallow the entire set of rules. And so I think there's going to be a lot to be said, and we'll have to look at you know, what it is the FCC said about specialized services. But you can think that some services uh, need to go across the internet differently. Uh, if we don't uh, treat certain services in a way, for example, voice, right? If we don't prioritize those packets, you can't have a conversation at the other end. Uh, streaming video, right? I think that people accept that in order to, for it to work, those, those packets will get prioritized as well. Uh, I think the challenge is going to be when you prioritize some video but not other video. Mm. Uh, and uh, so I think that there's, um, you know, there's a framework for debate, but there's a lot, of, uh, a lot in it. Um, because I don't think that FCC intends to make it difficult to do things across the internet. In fact, I think they intend the opposite. But it's, um, we'll have to look at uh, what it is actually put out. It's interesting. Uh, you know, one thing you mentioned there was, was packet loss. And, and yes. the FCC actually ad addressed packet loss in these new rules. So, so tell us about the, the transparency rule. The FCC has these regulations that, that require broadband providers to put out notices about their practices. Right. Actually, that's interesting. The transparency rule is one rule that actually the court had not overturned the last time. And this is a consumer protection rule. The FCC, the US uh, telecoms regulator, is a consumer protection agency in part. And so what this says is that carriers have to put on the internet or put in publicly facing terms and conditions what it is their service uh, offers. And so that rule has uh, stood and um, I think the FCC is expecting carriers to put up on the internet you know, what it is the service they're offering. Is it 25 megabits up, 25 megabits down? If so, if you put it up on the internet and you say it's that much, it should be close to that. That should be your, you know, your normal what you can typically expect because if you advertise that and deliver something very different, that's one of the ways the agency will go after you. Mm. With regard to packet loss, it's interesting because I think some of the carriers who had appealed the FCC last time around may have a bit of buyer's remorse here because these rules the FCC adopted this time appear to be a bit more stringent and a bit more um, far-reaching than the last framework we adopted. And the transparency rule is an example. Now carriers will have to actually disclose um, packet loss statistics on the web. And I think that's largely driven to ensure that um, the internet is safe for all sorts of uh, novel ways to deliver video. I think in the United States, one of the things that's happening uh, in, at rapid pace is the, um, the way consumers um, get video is changing. Our cable companies used to be the source of most video. Uh, consumers increasingly are getting their video over the internet. And uh, much of the controversy here stemmed from a case actually where it was Comcast, uh, the largest uh, cable company in the United States, was accused of throttling video traffic on its network, um, video traffic that could conceivably threaten its own position in the cable uh, distribution of video.
Hmm. Now, John, you know, we've talked about some of the basic net neutrality yeah. protections. We've talked about transparency, but the FCC wasn't so limited in its ruling. In fact, it applied a number of general common carrier regulations. Uh, so tell us what sorts of regulations did the FCC impose that go beyond the net neutrality regulations into the broader consumer protection area? Right, and this goes to um, the reclassification. The FCC reclassified the service as a common carrier service, and with that draws uh, an entire section of the uh, U.S. Communications Act that should apply. The FCC has at its disposal a tool we call forbearance, and it exercised that tool liberally in this context. So what it did actually was it exercised a forbearance tool and said most of the provisions of the common carrier regulations actually don't apply. They said, we were not even going to touch those. There's no tariffing, rate regulation provisions don't apply, et cetera. But they picked a handful of provisions that do apply. Uh, one is, um, and there's a couple basic ones. To, um, one is a concept that the carriers cannot engage in unjust and unreasonable practices. A very broad mandate. And what it, I think it's intended to do, and what we've seen it done in the past, is that it's intended to bar behavior that is uh, on the edges, outlandish behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, outlandish behavior in the terms of somebody doing something that just uh, offends the norms, uh, and uh, outlandish in the other way, where somebody just does nothing, right? So it's, um, it's unreasonable to um, do something that uh, people don't expect. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's probably unjust to do nothing when people expect you to do something, when the standard is that um, you will do something. And that gets to some of the other things that they included. For example, they included a section of the Communications Act that addresses privacy and data security. And, so, uh, and um, they had to do that, actually, I think. Mm -hmm. Because in the United States, um, the primary uh, regulator that addresses privacy is the Federal Trade Commission. And we have a very sector-specific focus on privacy in the United States. Um, many agencies have a piece of it. And um, in fact, the, uh, there are two in the United States that are members of GPEN, the Global Privacy uh, Enforcement Network, uh, the FCC and the FTC. But the F Federal Trade Commission does not have jurisdiction over common carriers. So the Federal Trade Commission, who's been most active in this space on um, regulating privacy and security in the internet, uh, in, in a way, likely has gotten boxed out of much of the action by the Federal Communications Commission reclassification. So the FCC needed to make clear that its own privacy and security framework, which is among the most convoluted in the world, uh, is going to apply here. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one other thing I'll point out that they did, a couple other things. They pointed out that uh, the rules that apply to utilities that allow them to attach a um, network to poles and run it through conduit, those apply as well. Why the FCC wants to ensure that broadband is being deployed. And if it's not being deployed, then they'll look to those rules to enforce those rules. Uh, another thing that they uh, attached, I think, is the universal service rules. In part, uh, the FCC has a mandate from Congress, the United States Congress, to ensure universal service in the United States. What that means is that uh, consumers in the U.S. should have affordable access to communication services, regardless of whether they live in high-cost areas like the mountains or swamps, or sparsely populated areas like farms, or in the cities. Uh, and so the Universal Service Program uh, provides money to ensure that broadband's uh, accessible at an affordable price for low-income Americans and those who just choose to li live out in the hinterlands. God. You know, that's, that's so fascinating. I, I want to turn back for a second to the privacy and data security sure. issue. So uh, there's this guy, David Clark. David Clark is one mm -hmm. of the internet pioneers. Uh, he ran the Internet Architecture Board in the early 80s. He's been following these issues and the development of, of the broader internet from an architectural standpoint. And his perspective is that you know, while net neutrality issues are important, block blocking and throttling, um, these are outlier issues. The real issue is that the broadband providers, they have access to all the data that flows over their pipe. They can build models off of your activity on the internet. Uh, your searches are caught within the, the URL, generally, um, and so they can use that information. Uh, they can use the sites that you visit, the devices that you connect. Think about uh, in the internet of things, every device is going to have an IP address, right? Uh, and so they know what device you're using, when you're using it, how much uh, how much traffic is, is flowing over it, uh, and they can use that to, to model you and to sell things to you that they're selling or to, to sell your information potentially to, to marketers. So this is a potential issue. So I wanted to dig a little bit deeper sure. into the privacy and data security issues. How did the commission address it in this latest order? 
I think that, um, well, first of all, we don't know all the details yet. There's an order that's coming down the pipe, but we know about the, um, what the commission has done is what they've said publicly in public statements and in very uh, carefully curated uh, documents, press statements, and summaries. The actual order is um, over 300 pages long, and the agency has not yet released it. Uh, it's taking uh, what they call editorial privileges to clean up the item. Despite what you may hear on the news, that's not unusual. And for an item of this significance, it, it may not come out for weeks still as they fine tune it. Um, because one of the reasons why they're paying such careful attention to the fine tuning is it, uh, it's certain that this item will be appealed. But on the privacy and uh, security front, I think um, it's important to note that what's going on in the room down there, and if, uh, if you go over to Mobile World Congress, is a, you know, a fabulous array of activity and entrepreneurship. But it's all based on people adopting the internet, and in particular, the mobile internet. And so um, at the core of that, though, is trust. And I think that uh, the US regulators, um, the FCC in particular, is very keen. Uh, maybe some people say it's late to the game, but it's very keen in understanding that unless they address privacy and security, um, they will not solve the adoption problem. They, they seem to think they have in the United States. And so in the United States, the Federal Communications thinks, Commission uh, thinks that we have a deployment problem and an adoption problem, that we're not deploying broadband quickly enough, and that there are too many Americans who don't have access to broadband, which has just been redefined in the United States as 25 megabits down, and three or four up? Uh, it's three up. Three up. So that's a, that's a new definition up from 10 megabits down. And so the United States has said, the regulators said, we're not deploying it fast enough. The other thing, uh, which is perhaps a harder problem to solve, is adoption. And so it's convincing people to adopt it, <clears throat> and that it's worth adopting. It's a, it's a keen problem, uh, particularly in l with low-income America. Mm. Well, it's interesting. I mean, on the adoption yeah. issue, w one thing that we've seen around the world, Mark Zuckerberg spoke yesterday about internet.org, uh, in order to boost adoption is its idea of zero rating certain services. Right. Um, now, on the one hand, that's an adoption issue globally. Here uh, in the U.S., or uh, not here in the U.S., but there in the U.S., there in the U.S., um, it's more about offering specialized services. It's, it, it's about offering uh, differentiated sure. um, uh, broadband plans. You know, for example, uh, T-Mobile has their, their music, music freedom plan. Right. So how does this order address zero rating? I think we can expect from what, what we know about the order and what the FCC said about it so far is that it doesn't. I think the FCC sidestepped this issue. I th so I think what you're going to expect from the Federal Communications Commission is that they're going to look at these things on a case-by-case -case basis. The example that you gave, um, you know, Deutsche Telekom's um, U.S. Uh, wireless affiliate uh, T-Mobile, they have, uh, you know, one of the things that they do to distinguish their service offerings, they have music for free. Uh, and so what I would say about the zero rating is on a case-by-case -case basis, I, I think the framework will be that if you're going to offer something for free, you probably need to think about offering the category for free. And then you get into sort of line drawing about how do you draw these categories, right? Uh, you know, I get my music from iTunes. I, mm -hmm. I think I know you well enough to know you get a lot of your music from YouTube. It's true. I don't necessarily think of YouTube as a music site. <laughs> um, but it's, um, I, I think that we'll learn about those things. And again, I think sort of the outlying behavior is what uh, you can expect to be curbed. Um, but I think zero rating is a challenging issue, um, particularly when Americans who, uh, most Americans don't have unlimited data plans, so they'll run out of their data at some point. And so if you run out of your data, but yet, um, you know, your Facebook keeps running, but your other social media networks don't, or your T-Mobile music keeps running, but you can't get iTunes. I mean, th those are the situations that will probably um, need to be addressed. Gotcha. So uh, I wanted to take a, a practical example under, sure. under these new rules. Um, the Internet of Things. Right. So as I'm sure everyone here knows, the Internet of Things is, a, uh, is the idea that there's going to be an ecosystem of objects connected to the Internet through sensors and wireless connections. Now, in some cases, it might uh, go over Wi-Fi or Zigbee uh, over a local network that you have in your house. And in other situations, it might go uh, over a, a cellular data network. Um, now, this industry is, is poised to be, I think it's 4.3 trillion euro in the next five years. Um, and there's going to be between 25 billion and 75 billion objects connected to the internet in, in the same period of time. So how do these new rules affect the IoT? I think the new rules for those folks who are interested in the IoT space and looking to build devices uh, and uh, products in that space, the rules should be, um, I, I imagine, a welcome development because the rules say you can connect anything to the network. 
uh, the future behavior standard. You can't, these are the big ISPs, the broadband providers, can't make it, they can't unreasonably disadvantage you. Uh, in uh, how they present their product. For example, if AT&T is spending a lot of money on the Internet of Things and, and its connected life product, uh, they need to make it such that you can choose another product. If you want to have a Google Nest thermostat, uh, AT&T can't make it so that it's impossible. And I think it'll be interesting to look at not only the technical issues, mm -hmm. which I imagine we're going to hear a bit about, but also looking at the pricing issues. Bundles, I think, could come into play and how carriers price bundles. On the technical issues, though, I think you can anticipate um, the carriers coming back and in some cases arguing that it, something cannot be done because of security concerns. If you watch um, what has happened in the United States and telecom regulation over the past 30 years, it said it's always been something, you know, the carriers don't want um, somebody to bring their own phone. It used to be the phone that and most Americans had attached to a kitchen wall and at one point leased from AT&T. There was a big debate about whether other phones could be used in the network, right? And so um, here, I think that and it was because it could harm the network. And there was a big debate about who could connect to the network and who could interconnect and whether we could interconnect with competitive providers. And the fear was it would harm the network. I think those cases need to prove out. And I think those people <coughs> should anticipate those arguments will be raised. And I think a little bit of privacy and a little security by design uh, will go a long way. If you can say, look, we built this and it adheres to some basic industry standards and best practices, uh, I think you won't be the carriers or you won't be the people who the big guys try and pick on and marginalize. Gotcha. So the, the general idea is that if you're a startup IoT provider, you can't wait until uh, version two or three to think about privacy and data security. Yeah, I, I think about it preemptively and, and enough to such that uh, you don't make yourself look like an easy target. Sure. sure. So we've been talking a lot about the U.S., but obviously there's been a debate around the world on the topic of network neutrality. A number of countries have uh, enacted network neutrality rules here in Europe. Um, we have uh, the Netherlands, Slovenia, and South America. Chile. Uh, really around the world these debates are going on and, and large advocacy organizations, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, Open Technology Institute and others have been engaging in this, uh, this conversation, this debate uh, with the broadband providers and the mobile providers around the world. Uh, so what I wonder is how do you think that this ruling from last Thursday will impact, if at all, the global debate? I, I'd like to focus it on Europe, right? In Europe, it's kind of funny because I, I do privacy and security law, and the European perspective is that the Americans don't regulate enough in the privacy and security space. Uh, and uh, the American response is that, well, we, we enforce our, what we have, uh, and it's just a different framework. Uh, here, I, you know, the early, uh, you know, the blowback that um, I think that uh, we're sensing from Europe is that the Americans have regulated too much. Uh, and to that, I'd say, I think if you look at what they've done, uh, the rules are largely presented in a way, um, uh, you know, things that the broadband providers can't do. They can't block consumers from getting to internet sites they want to get to. They can't block consumers from using an app like a voice application that competes with their voice product. They can't block consumers from connecting the next fabulous device to the network, whether it be some newfangled phone by some competitive provider or an IoT device. So I think that um, if you look at and you unpack and get you know, below the level of demagoguery that's, you know, on, you know, Fox News Channel and Sky News and whatnot. And what the FCC's done is actually rather benign. Uh, the only instance where they said you, you have to do something is that transparency rule. It's a consumer protection rule. That's not going to impact the way the Internet works. Um, but for if people actually have to say things in public, they're less likely to do things that don't make the Internet run well. They're less likely to... Um, deliver a product that has too many packets dropping for you to actually run, you know, your alternative video service over it. Gotcha. Uh, now, John, we're, we're running toward the end yeah. uh, of our time. Uh, so I just wanted to, to conclude uh, and ask you if you have any, any final thoughts and if there's anything that the people in the audience should think about uh, when they leave the room today. Yeah. In the United States, just like here in Europe, this, this debate's ongoing. This is not the last word on this. There's going to be what's called a further notice of proposed rulemaking attached to this order. So there'll be more to come in the FCC. They'll be acting on it uh, for years to come. We have not actually seen this 300-page order. There are going to be details in this order that may surprise us. Uh, so there's more to learn about what the FCC actually did. As I mentioned before, it's going to be appealed. And so this will be the third time this set of uh, rules have gone to the Court of Appeals. And the question is uh, whether or not they get upheld. If the court doesn't uphold hold them, 
courts in the United States don't typically say, all right, you lose. They say, you lose, go fix it. They remand it to the agency, and the agency has to go take another look at it. So I think there's a lot more to come, and I think if the you know, providers are interested in uh, you know, what's going on in the United States, they should um, try and find uh, a way to learn what's underneath all that uh, mass media. I think it's kind of funny in the United States that this issue hit the front pages of mainstream media. It came up in conversations with people who know nothing about uh, communications regulation just because it fueled into a very partisan political environment in the United States where you have uh, you know, Democrats, uh, the Democratic Party who's been accused of regulating everything to death and the Republican Party who um, thinks that nothing should be regulated if you, you, know, you buy into some of the rhetoric. Gotcha. So, so at base, there's still a lot that we, sure. we're going to learn. A lot could change, and there's an opportunity for people who are interested or might be affected to get involved. Right, yeah, and if you've got a particular business model that's impacted or uncertain, right, if you want to know, hey, am I a specialized service? Do I qualify for that? If in order to make my gizmo run or my product run, I need the network to do it in a certain way, right? If you think about the voice example, voice wouldn't work over the internet unless people agreed those packets get prioritized. Real-time video doesn't work over the internet unless those packets get prioritized. So if you have, you have questions about what it is you want to do, um, I think it, it pays to ask some questions because I think there, there are ways to navigate through it. I don't think right. the intention is to shut the internet down. Terrific. Well, thank you all very much uh, for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. If you have questions, feel free to uh, come find us in the hallway. And have a great lunch. Take care. Thanks.